Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please visit our website at concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you this week and really throughout this month for the next four weeks about an issue that affects all of us, worry and uh, what Jesus teaches us about worry. And you know, there was a time in my life when I really thought I was an easygoing guy, when I really thought I was a laid back guy. And what I, what I found out about myself in the years since then is that at that time of my life, I was just a guy without a lot of responsibilities, <laughs> right? And as more responsibilities came my way, I found out that, that sometimes more worry came my way. And I want to let you know, worry doesn't have to be an entirely negative thing. It's actually kind of a gift God gave us, a warning signal. And if we learn how to use it as God designed, it can, it can actually be a blessing, but a lot of us don't handle worry that way, and a lot of us handle it in such a way uh, that it actually beats us down and tears us up, and Jesus didn't intend for us to live like that, and that he give, gave us teachings because he knew this was very dangerous for us, so he taught a lot exactly about worry, and we're going to be going through his teachings for the next four weeks. Today, we're going to talk about kind of worry in general and worry about problems that, that we might have and uh, then over the next few weeks we'll get more specific like we'll talk about specifically one week about worry about relationships worry about money and more specific things that that we might struggle with I'd encourage you during this time if you're not already join us in our daily Bible reading plan you can find that online at concordunited.org slash Bible you can pick up a hard copy of the daily plan at the information desk in in the lobby and that's going to help these teachings of Jesus about worry not just to to become something interesting that you've heard about, but really become a part of your life and bless you. So I'd encourage you to be a part of that. Now, uh, according to a recent Gallup poll, 60% of Americans worry every day, right? They worry every single day. Now, when we talk about worry, we're not talking about like a little bit of fear like you get in certain instances. Like the other morning I was out, it was like about sunrise, and I noticed near me was a cat. And I noticed this cat that was near me had a, um, had, was basically black with a long white stripe down the middle. And that's when I realized it wasn't a house cat, it was a pole cat or a skunk. And uh, I began to run and it began to run and unfortunately it began to run the same way as me. And I experienced a fairly intense sensation of fear come over my body, which thankfully I was able to navigate out of that situation, no worse for the wear. But that's not what we're talking about in worry. Those moments where you just have like that, that, that fear because of the situation you're in, your body telling you, you need to, to react now. What we're talking about uh, over the course of the next four weeks in worry is chronic low-grade stress that you carry around with you all the time, that you allow to live rent-free inside your body, and that if you allow it to do that, if you allow it to just hang out and stay there, it has all kinds of issues. In fact, uh, according to the Mayo Clinic, worry leads to physical, mental, and emotional health problems. Uh, some of the short-term problems that chronic low-grade worry and stress lead to, headache, muscle pain, chest pain, fatigue, upset stomach, and sleeping issues. And if you let those go on and continue, they can lead to heart attack, stroke, asthma, depression, arthritis, all kinds of stuff. So how we handle worry is, is a big deal. And I, I want you to know, a lot of times I understand when you hear people say, don't worry, or even sometimes when we read some of Jesus' teachings and you hear the Bible say, do not fear, do not worry, it, it almost does more, it, it feels like it does more harm than good, doesn't it? People say, don't worry. And your first response is, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Like, do you think I wouldn't worry? If I knew how to not worry, do you not think I wouldn't do it? Like, like, like right? Like, like, really, you know, just, just don't worry. Well, well, how do you do that? How's, how's that even possible? And you just think, well, anybody who would just say that to me, they don't understand my situation. 
Friends, I want to let you know, Jesus understands your situation. And Jesus gives us teachings on worry to let us know uh, that there's another way of life. In fact, he offers us a way of life that is not ruled by worry. Where worry, we can use it the way it was actually designed for us. And the way worry was designed for us is something like a check engine light on your car. Like your car check engine light comes on. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean your car's totaled. It, it doesn't mean the engine's about to blow up and catch fire. It just means, hey, there's something going on. You should get it checked out. Now, some of us, when we see the check engine light, we're like, oh no, oh, I don't know how much this is going to cost. I don't, I don't know what's wrong. And so some of us take a very interesting tact in how we handle the check engine light. We ignore it and we pray to God, God, next time I turn on that car, please don't let that light come on, right? And then we drive it for a while and maybe eventually the light goes off. Possibly we've just blown the bulb because they never feared anybody would drive that long with the, that light on, uh, you know? And then when finally the car breaks down or something, we take it to the shop and a lot of times we find the original issue wasn't that bad, but it got real bad uh, because we were driving when, when on it because of the damage done while we drove on it. By the way, I'd like to let you know that this segment of the sermon is brought to you by your local auto repair dealer. Um, so it's kind of like that for our lives. Worry is actually just this check engine light saying, hey, you need to deal with that. Because if you just put it off, like it's going to get worse. And you're going to have this chronic low-grade stress. If you just ignore it or if you just think, I need to be more easygoing. Well, well that, that's not it. Uh, but Jesus shows us a way. And so I want to read to you his exact words about this. And then we want to break them down and say, okay, what way does Jesus teach us to handle worry? And specifically worry when we have problems in life. And this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, his famous, most famous teach, set of teachings from Matthew's Gospel. We're picking up in the sixth chapter with the 25th verse. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they neither toll nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Okay, so what's Jesus saying there? He, he, do, he doesn't just say, do not worry. He, be, he then begins to say why we're not supposed to worry. He tells us why. He says, you're not supposed to worry because God's going to provide for you. Because God provides for the birds of the air and the grass that, that grows up in the field. And God, God's going to, to provide for you. And what we find is when you have a situation you're worried about, right? Until you understand uh, your role in that situation, uh, worry's going to be around. Jesus wants us to understand our role is to trust God. And so one of the ways I remember this is that until you understand why you are here, you will always worry about what to do. Until you understand why you're here on earth, what your God-given purpose is, you'll always worry about what you are to do because you have no north star to, to guide you. But when you begin to say, okay, uh, I'm here to glorify God. Uh, I'm here to love my neighbor as myself. I'm here to love others as God has loved me. I'm here to treat others as I would be treated. I'm here to, to use my resources uh, to serve God and to, to bless others. Uh, when, when we get there, suddenly uh, th things get a little better when we understand why, right? When we understand why we are to do what we're supposed to do. Think about this in your life. Think about a, a situation that, that worries you. For me, when I have a situation that worries me, if I can figure out why 
then I'm several steps, why I'm in that situation and what my role is in that situation. I have situations all the time that don't turn out like I wish they'd turn out, but I'm okay and they don't cause long-term worry unless I don't understand uh, my role in them. If I don't understand my purpose. If I understand, uh, you know, why I'm in that situation and what my role is in that situation, all of a sudden I understand what I can control and I understand what I can't control. And, you know, we, I see it all the time in this church. We, we people, God created us resilient. We, we can actually handle great losses and great disappointments. But what, what we weren't created to handle is just this chronic worry. And so the first thing we do is we say, what's my role here? Why, why am I in this situation? And we recognize that every worry is an opportunity to serve others and to grow in faith. And, and here's why, because uh, once, once we understand this check engine light, right, that, that worry is a chance for us to say, okay, in this situation, how do I love my neighbor? How do I treat others as I wish I could be treated? And then after we do that and we figure out what can we control, uh, what, can, what can we do, what's the best thing to do, then all of a sudden we can surrender the rest to God and we can, we can grow in, in our faith. And so Jesus actually tells us exactly this in the, the, his teaching. First thing he does is he tells us why we don't have to worry. Then he tells us what to do. Seek first the kingdom of God, right? Seek first the kingdom of God is the key to conquering worry. Because we know that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we don't control the outcome of a lot of things. God, God controls that. And there are a lot of things that we're okay if it doesn't turn out okay. We just need to know what our role is within it right? Uh, I was listening to an interview recently with an author, Malcolm Gladwell. Some of y'all may have read his books. And he said the Christian faith, he actually uh, grew up Presbyterian and Mennonite, which is an interesting mix. Uh, and he said the Christian faith is all about being faithful in suffering. He said, but it's, it's hard to be a Christian in our current culture because current American culture is allergic to suffering in almost all its forms, Right? We, we have this fear that, that we simply don't have to have because of, of what God's given us. So what we want to do now, I know that's real theoretical, okay? Here, here's what we do with worry. We understand why, understand what our purpose is, and then we surrender it to God. I want to get real practical because the Bible actually gives us very good practical advice on this uh, that support everything Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If you look up today, what psychologists say about the best things that you can do to take your stress and anxiety level down. They actually dovetail right into what the scriptures tell us. What they say is, if you just in general want to take your worry down, there are three great things you can do. One, sleep enough, right? Sleep enough. Uh, uh, two, exercise enough. And three, enjoy a hobby. I actually heard a preacher one time say that basically 70% of being a Christian was getting enough sleep so that you're not grouchy and mean all the time. And I was like, well, there, there may be something to that. But the Bible actually teaches us this. Some of y'all may remember Psalm 127. It says this, it is vain that you rise early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toll, for God gives sleep to his beloved. Right? He wants you to sleep. He wants you to rest. He created sleep. God created naps. I just love that. Uh, um, you know, God created that. He expected us to rest. He's, he's going to, to take, take care of things. Um, two, exercise enough. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God with your body. Take, take care of your body. And exercise can look different. For some people, it's jogging. Some people like to lift weights. Some people like to go for hikes in the Smoky Mountains. Some people like to walk around the neighborhood. It doesn't have to be something intense or extreme. Just something where you're, you're moving and you're using the, the body God gave you. Because what, what we find about our bodies is, you know, they, uh, they'll rust out before they'll wear out. You know, they, they, were, they were made to, to use. And then finally, uh, enjoy a hobby. And you might think, you know, well, where's the hobby in the Bible? Unfortunately, because I've actually searched for this verse, I can't find it anywhere in the Bible that Jesus plays golf. 
I, I, I've looked and looked, and I'm really hoping eventually I can, I can find that, that they do some arche, you know, archaeological digs in Jerusalem, and they find like an old golf course there. Uh, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, but Jesus actually had a hobby. We see it in the scriptures. When he has free time, you know what he does? I think he was something of an extrovert. Uh, and he goes to his friends' houses, and he hangs out. Like, that's what he loved doing. It's not that whenever he's at somebody's house, he's always healing somebody. We, we have all these instances where he says, hey, let's go here and let's go visit these people just because they're my friends. Like, just because I want to see them and spend time with them. And we shouldn't be surprised that we have hobbies and that they're good for us. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so, God created this world where the world's, we're going to see God through the world we live in. And so, of course, things in this world are going to fascinate us. And we're going to find joy in them because we're going to see something of God in them. And whatever that hobby is, uh, whether it's playing a musical instrument, whether it's quilting, you know, uh, whether you like coding on your, your computer and your, your free time, what, whatever your hobbies are, man, that, that's, that's God's gift, and so those are, those are good things for us to do. And then finally, based on Jesus' teachings, how do we stop worrying when we have a very specific problem, right? A very specific problem. And uh, the, what, what we find is that there, there is a way, and it's what we've talked about. It's first, uh, I, I remember using the word pass, purpose, act, surrender, shine, Purpose, act, surrender, shine. So the first thing is we say, why am I here? What's my role in this situation? What's my purpose in this particular situation? And it's important that we ask that first, right? Because if somebody, uh, you know, eventually we're going to get over to surrendering it to God. But if somebody breaks their leg, like let's say somebody falls at the church and breaks their leg. They don't care if I pray for them, but they just assume I get them to the hospital first right? Like, I'm not going to sit there and go, God, I'd like you to magically set this leg. I'm going to go, let's get you to Park West, and then we're going to pray uh, when, when, when we're there, or to Tenova, or wherever we can get, can get you. So, pr your first thing is say, why am I in this situation? What's my purpose? Next is to act, and by act, make a plan. And it might be that your plan is like, okay, my plan is there's, I'm, I'm going to do what I can do and then there's other things I'm not going to do because it wouldn't be good, wouldn't be healthy, whatever it is, but figure out your role in the situation, make a plan, act, work your plan, and then surrender the rest to God. Well, you know, if somebody breaks their leg, once you get them to the emergency room, that's when we pray, right? We surrender, we say, God, whatever you want from this situation, uh, we've done everything we can with everything you've given us to address it. I'm going to surrender it. And you'd be amazed what happens when you really surrender something. Uh, so, some of us, it's been a long time since we've really surrendered things to God. Uh, some of us, we can remember a time in life where we really surrendered a lot to God. But it's been years since then. And we've just been holding on to a lot of stuff for years. And it's time to say, okay, I'm going to think about my role. I'm going to do what I can, God, and then I'm going to surrender. And then the last one is just as important as the other three. Uh, shine, shine. You, and, and that means that you go about living your life joyfully and, and you don't constantly just let this pull you down. Some of us, I, I know none of us do this. We just know people who do this, but they will have a problem. And because of that problem in life that they're dealing with, they will refuse to be happy about anything else right? That they will absolutely refuse to even smile, even be happy about anything because they've got this issue. 97% of their life's going great. 3% is difficult. And that's just all they're focused on is, is that 3%. And that, can, that happens to, to all of us. But just several paragraphs before this passage on worry in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says something else that you'll probably remember. Jesus says, let your light shine before others. So they might see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. He, he, he compares your light to, you know, a light that you put in a room. And he says, no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand. So it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. When you've done all you can do, when you've surrendered to God, then go live joyfully. And trust God with it. Just trust God. And trust God that if it works out poorly, you know what? You'll be strong enough. 
You know, you, you worship a God who conquered death. God, God will give you the strength you need for however that works out. Even if you lose your life, God will give you the strength and you'll see God's victory and God's glory in, in amazing ways. Um, we, we, we believe that, but go shine. Go, go, go live joyfully because God's got it, right? You're going to do what you can do and God's got it. Now, that is so easy to say. It is so hard to do. I'll even acknowledge with you that for me, it, it's very hard. If I try to do that on my own, I don't have a chance. The only way I do is by asking Jesus to do that through me. And we're about to come to the communion table. And this communion is a gift from Jesus given directly to us at saying, this is my body, this is my blood. When you come and you receive me, uh, you're, when you receive communion, you are inviting Jesus into your life and you're inviting his power to live th in you and through you, through the Holy Spirit. And it is amazing what can happen in that situation. It's amazing how you can find joy and blessing in circumstances you wouldn't have thought of. It's amazing how you can find peace even when everything hasn't worked out and all the pieces of the puzzle don't fit perfectly. He's given that to us. So in just a moment, we're going to invite you to come forward. And, and when we do, I, I hope this can simply be a time where you say, Jesus, I want to live by your way, a way that's not ruled by worry a way that lets me shine, a way that lets me shine my light the way I was created to in, in your image, and that you'll trust him. Uh, that when you encounter issues, you'll go home and you'll do what you can. You'll try to get enough sleep. You'll, you'll try to exercise some. You'll tr enjoy hobbies. Uh, and that when you have a specific issue, you'll, figure, you'll ask, why am I in this situation? Make a plan for what you can do. Surrender it. And then just let his light shine through you. Because the fact of the matter is what we believe about God, what we believe about what God's done for us in Jesus Christ, everything that could go wrong can, can go wrong and we still come out way ahead. The ending is still better than anything we could ask for or imagine or, or ever hope for for ourselves. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we come before you as your children, acknowledging how many times we spend our energy worried about things of which that you have already conquered, of which you are in control. So God, we ask you that as we come to this communion table to give us the strength and the power we need to live lives of joy, even in a world full of problems, to no longer ignore our worries out of fear, but to face them in faith, in full confidence that we will see your victory in this life and in the next. No, God, we can pray this prayer and we have this hope because of what your son Jesus Christ has done for us. Because uh, on the night before he was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and knowing of the difficulties they would go through, he took bread and he said, this is my body. And he took wine and he said, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so God, let this communion bread and communion juice be for us the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we might be for this world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We pray this in your most holy name. May all glory and honor, all power and praise be yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.